Welcome to the Essentially You podcast, Dr. Sean Tassot. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you. It's been so long. I know it has been so long and gosh, it's been so long since we've seen each other. I need to come out to, I need to come out to Austin is what I need to do. Or you can come out here to San Diego. It's not, it's not too bad here. Well, it's easier for me to go there because I don't have a baby. That is true. Yes, we are. We are navigating. We're about to travel with the baby for the first time. We are trying to navigate all of the ins and outs. Probably I should ask you. I know it's been a long time since you had a baby, but I doubt I'm sure you traveled with your children at one point. Yeah, I think my daughter, who actually just got married uh, last week. Yes, she did. When she was like a week old, we flew on an airplane. And actually, when they're really young, it's easy because they actually don't, they don't even wake up. You know how they are. As they get older, like around, I think your guys four months now or something. Five, oh yeah, about five months. And they get a little bit more demanding, you know, they poop a lot and, you know, I got to change diapers and all that, but uh but yeah, I remember I took my two-year-old on a flight to Paris once and he threw up like all over me a couple of times. So that was, that was good. Oh my goodness. That is, that is brave. That is brave to take a two-year-old across the ocean for sure. I was dumb. Actually, I, I think I was probably in my late thirties and didn't know any better. I love it. Well, we're talking about, we're not talking about babies today. We're talking about women's health and you are one of my go-to experts when it comes to really helping women navigate with ease and grace. And you've got a new book out. I can't, I'm so excited. And we've been talking about this book for so long. I know a lot of our, our audience members, our readers don't necessarily know everything that goes into writing a book and you poured everything into this. I am so excited. But before we get into what the book is all about, I want to just ask, you know, you've been serving women for a long time and you decided to take a really integrative approach, probably right out the gate and correct me if I'm wrong there. Talk to me, Dr. Shantason, about what was the impetus for you to serve women with an integrative mindset? You know, I think initially what happened as tends to happen in people's lives when they have kind of a traumatic experience right out of residency. I was actually in residency. um, So I was really young. My mom got diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And so she was like 51, I think at the age of her diagnosis. And you know, you have a mom that's in her fifties and she looks like she's in her thirties. My mom was kind of similar, very healthy. And she just was having pain, got diagnosed with this ovarian cancer. And she lived for five years, but what I found was, while I knew a lot about the disease process itself, what I couldn't help my mom with was uh, the chemo. Like she would have joint pain and she would have insomnia and she lose her hair and, and her skin changed. And I couldn't help her just be comfortable or be like, you know, just like a normal person. And, and I, when she finally passed away, I looked at those five years that she was alive after her diagnosis and it was pretty miserable. It wasn't like she was living her best life, which I just said to myself at that point, I was like, you know, I can't, I can't know all of this information and not be able to even help my own mother, you know, when she's suffering. And so I just was reading a book at the time called eight weeks to optimum health written by Andrew Weil. At that time, it was like 2002 and uh, crazy stuff like- Very radical. (laughs) CoQ10 and and all this stuff that at the time was like crazy. Amazing. And I lived in Tucson and his fellowship for integrative medicine was at the University of Arizona, which just happened to be in Tucson. So I just kind of just went on a little sabbatical and just did a two-year fellowship in integrative medicine. And then- In that two-year module, they had a section on spirituality, and I just found that totally fascinating, and that's when I went out and got my PhD in philosophy in 2015. Mm. So that was kind of the the impetus. I can imagine going, being at the end of medical school and being highly educated and then finding yourself hopeless in the throes of your mom's disease, you know, disease when she was dying. And and, in the five years is a, is a long time to not live your best life. And so I know I can imagine that you would want to have a different outcome for your patients moving forward. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, the thing is, is I'm an only child. So you kind of, uh, you run that gamut of being the, you know, she wants me to be the doctor and like answer questions and stuff, but I'm trying to be the, the son and, 
I didn't even have any options like, you know, like turmeric or what, all the stuff that we know about now for inflammation and, and, and sleep, like hops, like I use hops all the time for patients. And so it's like, yeah, I didn't know any of that. So I couldn't really help. I couldn't do anything except for listen to her. And I felt completely helpless. And even back then I wasn't using a lot of hormones and, and they weren't letting her actually have her hormones. And had I known now uh, what I, what I had, I known back then what I knew now, I would have put her on hormones because she wasn't living her life. You know, it was, it was somebody else's life and she wasn't happy. And I think, you know, and maybe it would have shortened her life by a couple of months to go on hormones, but she would have had a much better life, you know? And so that's kind of where I try to really help with women, especially I get a lot of women that have breast cancer that can't necessarily go on hormones, but now I have other ways of helping. And a lot of other friends like Veronique and some other people that I can refer to. And that's been the other part of the journey that's been really great for me is meeting people like you that do all of these other things, because as you know, expertise, it's, you can't be an expert in essential oils by just no pun intended dabbing. You have to immerse yourself, right? Yeah. And and with hormones, you kind of want to do it all the time to get good at it. So it's been great meeting other people in different fields like you. Well, you definitely have your 10,000 hours and we're going to speak into that right now because there's a lot of, you know, we, we kind of have a sense of what women are struggling with and, and, and navigating, especially as, as they get older, you know, hormones are shifting, but there are two hormonal imbalances that you see pretty frequently that aren't always on the map. Can you go into those a little bit more? Well, I was a little bit shocked. Um, I have a quiz that, that filters women into based on how they answer these 30 questions the top 12 hormone imbalances. And I always thought the number one hormone imbalance in women was estrogen dominance, but it turns out to be that one's number two. Far and away, I've had probably 20,000 women take my quiz. And then also looking at labs that I've done for years, testosterone deficiency is far and away number number one in, in women of, of all age groups. And, and I talk about, my book is about describing these 12 hormone imbalances through story. So um, I use archetypes. So testosterone deficiency is called the nun and estrogen dominance is called the queen. So, you know, when I talk about estrogen dominance and I talk about what I would, would find is if I told a patient, oh, you have estrogen dominance, they'd get that glassy eyed look. But if I could talk in the storyline of a, the queen and how it kind of makes you feel out of control and you're biting people's heads off and you're off with their heads, kind of a queen. And, and I would start talking in that language, which was stories that I'd heard for decades in practice. And I just filtered them into these archetypes. I was really found that I was connecting. And then the, so you've got estrogen dominance, testosterone deficiency. And then I teach in the book, there's a six step process that includes spiritual practices, hormones, infraceuticals or energetic information transferred to the body, like with essential oils, nutrition, exercise, and then supplements, how you can balance out those hormone imbalances 80% of the time, just through self-care. Hmm. Whoa. I, I want to hear more about this, but before we get into that, cause I do, I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm curious. And mind you, I'm, I'm a big self-care person. I know we we've had so many conversations over the years, lots of them. And, and the reason I think we are so interconnected in what we think really can serve women, but talk to me about testosterone, because I think a lot of times it is not on the radar as much as cortisol, estrogen, progesterone, thyroid hormones. I feel like it kind of gets swept under the rug. And I think one of the reasons why testosterone kind of gets swept under the rug is we don't really have viable. I mean, you have viable solutions, but I would say that mainstream medicine does not have viable solutions for low testosterone in women. Well, there's no, currently there's no FDA approved testosterone supplement or replacement on the market for, for women. There's probably 10 for men, but not one for women, which in my opinion really goes to show you how paternalistic and how much we don't care about females and their health because sexual health is super important, but not just that, but just, just feeling good, just feeling energized. The testosterone deficiency for women typically feels like fatigue, especially around four or five in the afternoon. I jokingly say if it was a t-shirt, it would just say meh, like I don't care. 
because that's how you feel like stuff that you normally cared about you just kind of don't care about anymore you lose you lose a step you're not quite as decisive maybe as you used to be hair can be a little bit thin and women that have that have just kind of assumed that that's just part of getting older so what do we do well if you want to give a female testosterone replacement you really have to compound something so you either do a cream a sublingual some doctors you know obviously use pellets but uh, testosterone replacement has to be made in a compounding pharmacy. Mm. And that is, you have to work with an integrative practitioner. There's just a lot of other hoops and steps you got to do. Speaking, you just mentioned pellets and I'd love for you to have an outrage moment <laughs> around pellets <laughs> in general. Pellets are for animals, not women. And, and I say that tongue in cheek, because I also believe that they're okay in men, because men, if you, if a testosterone level goes too high on a guy, it just makes him more of a jerk, really. I mean, it's not going to necessarily do him in for his testosterone to be a little high. For a woman, high testosterone over a period of time can actually have some negative sequelae like uh, clitoromegaly or voice deepening changes, and those are permanent changes, like they don't go away you know, not to mention just hair growth and it changes the cholesterol profile and all kinds of stuff for females. So for women, pellets are bad. And there's lots of reasons I don't like pellets. One being it's a procedure. You have to, it's a big needle. It has to go under your skin, usually on your butt every three to four months. And it's not, it's, it hurts. It's a little painful. The main reason I don't like it is just cost. It's, it's about three to $400 every three to four months, whereas a cream is 45 bucks a month. If you put a pellet in and you don't like the side effects, you can't take it out. So you're stuck with it for three to six months. Whereas a cream, you just stop it. And stop it using out. it. Yeah. Um, and then just, you know, cost. And, and a lot of the times, and I, I hate to kind of get into all this, but usually the people that are putting pellets in are not super experienced in hormones. And what they do is they'll go to these conferences that these pellet companies put on for a weekend or a day and a half, and they, they go back to their practice and they use this protocol that the company has. Um, here's their labs, and then here's what you put in their pellet, and then you just go put it in. And it's a big money maker. It makes a lot of money. That's why you see plastic surgeons doing them now, and, and everybody under the sun is doing these pellets. And I can tell you that most women that get pellets probably do it one time and then they come in and they're, they don't want to do them anymore because they, it just doesn't, doesn't feel right. Yeah. I can imagine that's a lot of dosage that cannot be changed or shifted. Like you said, once you put them in, not only is it uncomfortable, but you can't take it out. You just have to ride that storm out. And you and I both know that, you know, bioidentical synthetic hormones, hormones in general are very powerful. And, you know, that's a long time to have a, a decent sized dosage may not be the right dosage of a specific hormone in the body that you can't, you can't regulate. No, you can't. And and that's the other thing is it just puts undue stress on, on the liver as it's trying to process things. And most women whose testosterone, I'm not, I'm talking testosterone levels that are maybe even higher than like mine, just from their pellets. And, and some women feel good, like, because you will feel better for a little while, but then it starts to make you angry and it starts to make you edgy and and, and most women that, that don't like it, they feel like they're just coming, going to come unglued at any, at any given time. And some people need that. Like I always just say, when you, if you feel like you want to choke someone out, sometimes they need to be choked out and that's okay. But it's when they don't need to be choked out and you want to choke them out. That's when it's a problem. So like when your kid spills a glass of milk and you want to destroy the earth, that's abnormal. And, and usually that can be a lot of hormone imbalances, like low progesterone or yeah. something like that. But high testosterone can definitely, as a matter of fact, the high testosterone women, I call them warriors because they're, they're just kind of always wanting to fight. How often do you see women with high testosterone? I guess maybe that's with symptoms around PCOS, but I, I know for me, you know, when I've looked at a lot of labs over the years, I would say after the age of 35, I, I rarely see women with, with normal or high levels of testosterone, like ever. 
usually even younger women nowadays, unless they have something like a PCOS. Whenever I see a high DHEA or a high, high DHEA, we see a lot because of stress, but mm -hmm. high, high testosterone. I just had a lady in the other day that was uh, menopausal and she has high testosterone and that's not normal. So my first question is, do you have pellets? No. Second question is always, is your husband using anything like androgel or putting on a gel because I've had some patients where the husband will put the gel on and he'll put it on his abdomen or something and then they'll have sex and he's just giving her the gel back. And so she said no with that one. And then basically in a woman that age that's got high testosterone, you have to look for adrenal and um, ovarian tumors. So, because that's not normal. And a woman that's younger, like you said, PCOS, um, they can have high testosterone levels. And it's usually not like through the roof high, but barely outside of the normal range. Yeah, absolutely. I was just saying that you, on average, the only time I ever see it like a little bit above normal or even normal is when I see women struggling with PCOS. And so I just wanted to speak into that. Given that there's no FDA approved, you know, dosage for women, what, what can, what are some of the things that we can do to help boost testosterone? You know, I'm a big fan right now. I'm kind of making this transition into looking at minerals and heavy metals. It's been something that I've struggled with a long time just because I'm, I've always wanted a lab that was accurate. And uh, there's a guy out here in Austin who has a upgraded formulas that does a hair test. Actually, I just did mine. I haven't gotten the results yet. Um, but maximizing those things like zinc, things like copper in your body and lowering, you know, any toxicities, whether it's heavy metals. And, and I know that that whole toxicity thing gets into this area where a lot of people argue and stuff and you know but i mean it's just it's eating crappy it's you know when you when women have obesity and they have high estrogen levels it raises a protein in your body called sex hormone binding globulin sex hormone binding globulin grabs onto the testosterone in your bloodstream and inactivates it so you might actually have a decent hormone level you might have a normal testosterone but the free testosterone which is what's active in your body could actually be low because you have extra estrogen making all that sex hormone binding globulin that's grabbing on all your testosterone and that's what excess weight can do that's what birth control pills can do as well so women that are on birth control pills sex hormone binding globulin goes up and their free testosterone levels go down so uh, girls on birth control pills will often complain of low libido which is another way, I guess, birth control pills work if they do. And feeling meh. Yeah. And yeah. Feeling meh. I see, that's what I'm saying is I see testosterone deficiency in 23 year olds. And to tell a 23 year old that she doesn't need to have any testosterone is ridiculous at her age. She should have testosterone. Got it. Okay. So lifestyle is a big part of this equation. I know lifestyle is a big part of the estrogen dominance equation. Intensity interval training can raise weightlifting is huge. I usually will get people to uh, follow uh, a great person like Stephanie Estima, who's really into the fitness part and explains things, or Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who we're friends with, who's really into the proteins and the muscle building, because that's what's going to keep your testosterone up too, because it also burns fat, because a pound of muscle at rest is going to burn 50 calories a day just sitting around. Hmm. Yeah, agreed. Agreed, agreed on all of those fronts. And yes, please go follow Dr. Stephanie Estima and Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, two of our dearest friends. Amazing. They've been on the show before. Two of my, I was just texting with both of them today, actually. And I was having a conversation about the importance of strength training for, for women in particular for so many reasons. Now, the other hormonal imbalance, which we talk a lot about on the show, I don't, I don't speak into testosterone as much as you do. And I'm so grateful to have you on the show to talk about a hormone that does get ignored a little bit more than than the other ones, but the other, the second one, which is the queen, we talked a little bit about estrogen dominance. You know, how often are you seeing that outside of women in perimenopause, or is that oftentimes where you're seeing estrogen dominance? So I always talk about hormone imbalance and, you know, there's this big push on the allopathic side. You know, there's doctors out there saying hormone imbalance is a scam. It's not real. It's blah, blah, blah. So, but there are times when hormone imbalance is normal. The times when hormone imbalance is normal, menopause. Now, I'm not saying it's it doesn't suck, but it's normal. And pregnancy is a vast hormone imbalance, but it's completely normal. And at certain times in your menstrual cycle, hormone imbalance is normal. When the imbalance becomes a problem is when it interferes with the way that you want to live your life. So women that come in with estrogen-dominant symptoms 
headaches, mood swings, irregular, heavy, painful periods. If they're just coming in like on day nine of their cycle and it, you know, they're having some discomfort, that could be just a normal imbalance and you could help with magnesium, maybe some fish oil or something like that. But if she's not having periods every month and, and she's gaining weight because she's insulin resistant, that's an, that's an abnormal hormone imbalance. And that's where estrogen dominance, it can just start that cascade where then she's, you know, then you hear that all the time. I'm barely eating anything. I'm working out and I'm still gaining weight. And that's that PCOS kind of, kind of picture. But we tell people that, um, hormone imbalances don't exist to me is misogynistic. And most of the people saying it are actually female doctors, which blows me away. But how can you say they don't exist? I mean, we know they exist. It's all so interconnected. I was, I was just showing Emily Fletcher. I was doing my little interview. I was just showing her my, my continuous glucose monitor from levels. And one of the, you know, one of the conversations I have a lot, not only with, with estrogen dominance, but also my concern for women, in the, the cascade of insulin resistance and, and what that can look like. And some, so, so often when we're talking about our reproductive system and our reproductive hormones, we don't think about the, the implication that insulin can have on our reproductive system or the connection between insulin resistance and estrogen dominance. And that's when like, when you look at, you blow up hormonal imbalances. Now we're talking about a decrease in cellular energy. We're talking about a decrease in metabolic rate and, you know, leading to a lot of other problems down the road. And so I do feel like it's irresponsible of us as practitioners to pretend like these imbalances don't exist, you know, how pre-diabetes and diabetes does, you know? Yeah. So and I'm grateful you're speaking into that. I think part of it is, you know, part of it is, it's funny because I call it, a friend of mine, Larry Dossie brought this up. It's called the beef stroganoff principle. And it's like one side is calling it beef stroganoff. The other side is calling it beef with noodles. It's the same thing. We're both, we both just need to define it the way that we want it as practitioners. And so you know, sometimes the functional side will get kind of bogged down in a lot of the testing. The allopathic side just gets bogged down in the fact that there isn't a, a diagnosis code for it. But the reality is, it's like my mom, it's like, you know, there are patients suffering. I see this all the time with this subclinical hypothyroidism where their, their free T3 is normal, but they're in the basement of normal, you know, and it, if you just bump them up to the middle of normal, some of them feel like completely different people but you're just going to tell them, oh, you're fine. You're normal. And I always kind of like in hormones, like you're either in the house or you're not in the house. And if you're in the house, where am I in the house? So if my thyroid is normal and I'm in the house, but I'm laying on the floor in the basement, well, you might feel better upstairs, you know, still in the house, still normal, but doctors don't usually separate that. And I think that that's, I have been finding at least that's pretty important. I think, you know, for a lot of people, same thing with testosterone. I absolutely agree. I'm speaking from a woman who was, who has Hajimoto's thyroiditis. And for the most part, my labs looked normal. Definitely free T3 was off and a couple of things were off, but they were, they were on the low side of normal, but it was considered normal to a lot of people, but I was definitely in the basement. You know, I was not upstairs chilling in the kitchen, you know, having a nice time. And so I would, I was easily ignored, ignored, ignored until connecting to our colleagues. And they were like, oh no, no, you, we need to handle this, you know? And so, yeah, there's a spectrum for so much of this. And I, you know, it's particularly what, even with estrogen dominance or insulin resistance, like things can look normal, this watch and wait mentality of like normal, normal, normal. Oh, now you've got diabetes, you know, and, and what happened where we could have caught this in the interim, like what we could have made these shifts and changes then. And I know that's a lot of what your book is addressing is how can we make these, these incremental shifts and changes, even when things can look a little bit normal, you don't feel super great. Here are things that we can do to make a pretty big transformation. Yeah. And that's part of it. And I, the other thing I wanted people to know is that it's, like I said, 80% of what I do is talk about self-care stuff. So you only need doctors maybe 20% of the time. And, you know, and also just knowing things like, you know, like I said, when you have a lot of friends, you know, like getting people to the proper nutrition expert, getting people to the proper spiritual practice, if they're not used to doing one, 
whether, you know, our exercise, I, I have a really good friend of ours who actually shared this story online. So I can mention her name, Deb flipping 50, Deb Atkinson. She, her whole life is centered around working out. That's her brand. That's what she does. And she teaches women at over 50, how to work out. Well, Deb was doing too much with too little. So she had kind of a low normal cortisol, which is what I call the saboteur. And the saboteur is a personality trait where they take care of everybody, all everything, business, people, but they don't take care of themselves. And so they've gone through a workaholic phase and now they're kind of at the bottom. So I told her, I was like, Deb, you, you, you really need to not, to not work out, like walk, don't do high intensity. You know, you got to recharge your batteries. And after she flipped out, she was like, I can't not work out, you know, it's my brand. And so I said, well, just teach people some yoga moves and teach people, you know, other things. And she lost six pounds in a month just by slowing down. And so sometimes it's a little counterintuitive and you just, and I've only learned this. This is the other thing. My book isn't, it's not me telling women what to do. It's the tens and thousands of women that I've listened to and it's just their stories. And I've just kind of learned from those stories. So it's more of a, you know, a journey and, and, and the voices of all those women that have uh, sat down before them and I've just come up with the stories. I love it. I can't wait. I, I'm so excited. I have it. I don't have the book yet, I, but I know, I know my copy's coming, right, Sean? <laughs> yeah, I think they said a couple of weeks. Okay. Awesome. I love it. The, okay. The big question that comes up a lot too, you know, we're talking about hormonal imbalances and yes, they're real. And yes, if you're feeling like your life is disrupted, it's important to look and see what's going on in terms of testing. What is your recommendation around that? And how often should we be getting tested? And is it always necessary if we can take a quiz like yours? Nothing's really going to substitute, obviously, for medical care and blood draws and things like that. But it's kind of a fun test and it's pretty accurate because it's just on how you're answering the questions. And it just gives you kind of an idea. I have had many people write me and say, oh, spot on or whatever. So it's actually kind of fun to try it and then just give you an idea of where to start. As far as testing goes, the three avenues to test right now are urine, blood, and um, saliva. I'm not a huge fan of salivary testing except for cortisol levels. Um, saliva just, in my opinion, isn't re as reproducible and isn't as reliable. That being said, blood is obviously super accurate because it's what's in your blood. Uh, you can test thyroid and vitamin D through blood, which you can't do through urine usually. Uh, there are some urine tests coming out where you can, but right now it's kind of limited. Blood is limited by the fact that it's only when that needle's in your arm. So it's like a snapshot of you right then and there. Um, so the doctor needs to know a little bit more about you, like what time of day it was drawn, when you took your medications and things like that. Blood is usually also covered by insurance and it's usually very quick turnaround time, like maybe three or four days. Urine is a great test too, it's accurate. It's a 24 hour test, so it gives us a little bit more information. It checks melatonin, it checks cortisol, it checks vitamin B12, B6, dopamine, some other neurotransmitters like norepinephrine. So it's got more to it. It doesn't check vitamin D and it doesn't check uh, thyroid panels. And it takes about three to four weeks to get results back. And it's about 300 to $400 somewhere in there. So it's a little bit more expensive. So as far as testing goes, I usually will start with blood just because people that come see me have insurance. I'll usually get people started on something and then see them back in about four to six weeks. If they want to, uh, if they feel like they want to check their levels again, we'll check again. But then once I get them on a stable dose, I'm either checking hormones maybe every six to 12 months. Got it. Good to know. Good. And I love the breakdown most particularly around cost and time efficiency, what is recommended. And with urine, we can look at, you know, we get a broader picture of even testosterone, DHEA. We can even see cortisol there, estrogen, progesterone, estrogen pathways. And so there's, there is a little bit more information that we can get that kind of gives us maybe a bigger picture. Like if you're feeling this way, oh, this makes sense. If this one's off and this one's off, I can see that correlation as a practitioner, but yes, agreed that blood is the fastest and most people it covers insurance, but it is just a snapshot in time. 
So that is helpful. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to ask you before I know we get going, because I want to, I want to speak into more about the book um, on top of the archetypes that we're looking at when it comes to implementing the self-care and implementing the lifestyle, is there a, how to get started inside of the book for every archetype? There's a plan. So, you know, part of the, part of at least what I found was difficult and you can probably talk to this is to write a book with all that information you have you have the ability to lay it all out for people, right? Like I could say, do this, 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 and this. But part of what I like is one, it's a choice. So you, the, the beautiful thing is you could choose all six things to try. You could choose one thing to try first, but also I didn't want it to seem like an infomercial and I didn't want it to seem like you have to run out and buy all this stuff. Sure, do I think that a woman with estrogen dominance is gonna benefit from, you know, increasing fiber and dim and a couple of other supplements. Sure. And I think it would be great. And, and maybe have some candles that like clary sage or some other things that, that work for that type of an issue. Sure. And I lay all that out. I'm trying not to package it into something where you have to do it this way. I think the beauty of, of what I've tried to do is my, my, the way I always do medicine is I, I love to give people a bunch of options and then have them pick whatever resonates. There's going to be a lot of people that don't resonate with acupuncture or, um, you know, Reiki or something like that. They would rather do just the hormones. And then there's other people that would maybe want to try supplements before starting an actual medication. And you just have to know that when you do that, the results may not happen. And if they do, it may take a little bit longer because it's a supplement, not a medicine. But, um, you know, everybody's a little bit different. And so I have diet plans and stuff that people can, can look at as well for each of the archetypes. Hmm. Okay. Perfect. So, so there's a lot of choice. There's a lot of figuring out like what feels good for me to start here. Cause I know so often with any of us, it's always that question of how do we even start? Like, what do we, what do we do? And I know for you, besides grabbing the book, the hormone balance Bible, that first step is really trying to understand what their hormonal archetype is. And we would, we would be able to go and do that at the quiz. I know that we only went over three of the archetypes, but I know that they all get into some pretty clear hormonal imbalances and how we can clear those up. Yeah. And a few of them, three of them are blending of two of the other ones. So, and I could have come up with so many more because everybody's a little aspect of some or the other. And the beautiful thing about it is you're going to change too. So even, even women that are menopausal, which I call the wise woman, once you start on hormones, I've had women that take the quiz and they'll take it after they go on thyroid medication. And then she, she wrote me an email and she said, oh, just so you know, your quiz is wrong. It says I'm, hypo, I'm hyperthyroid, but I'm actually hypothyroid. And I said, well, why, how long have you been taking your meds? And she's like, oh, six months. And I said, how long has it been since you had your blood checked? And she said, it's been like six months. So she went and checked her blood and she was actually hyperthyroid because she had a racing heart and she was, and so the quiz, just by asking her those questions, put her in that category. So it's, it's pretty great because even, you know, you can change like, so in her case, she was menopausal, which was the wise woman, but the hyperthyroidism makes her, the archetype there is the, uh, the overachiever. And so you can switch in and out of archetypes. Got it. Depending on what you're doing or if some, another imbalance comes into play. So you can, it's kind of always its own litmus test as well of what's going on. I love that. I think, I think it's important, you know, we, we ask ourselves those questions and figure out what's going on with our bodies, especially if we are seeking medical attention and there's recommendations giving to us, especially hormones, like they move fast, you know, dosage has got to be dialed in. We got to figure out the right dosage, or you could easily become hyperthyroid, or you could, you could go from low Low, low estrogen to a lot of estrogen really quickly. And so I, I love that we can keep testing and figuring out what's going on with our bodies based on that quiz. And where can, I know we're sending people to the quiz, but where else can we get the book? Where do you want us going for the book? Well, the book's going to obviously be on uh, most booksellers, Amazon, yes. Barnes. It's going to be on book people. I mean, it's, it's going to be nationwide. It's through HarperCollins. So you can actually get it from their website as well. And um, we will have a link uh, that we'll put on your notes here because there's going to be a cool page that's going to have um, where places where people can get an autographed copy. And actually, 
if they know what the archetype they are, they take the quiz. I'll actually write something for them about their archetype in the book. That's awesome. I love that. Ooh, sign copies. I love that idea so much. Well, Dr. Tassone, it was such a pleasure to have you on. I'm so excited for the book. I'm so excited for the quiz. I'll have all of those links in the show notes for where to get everything. And I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. It's been too long. I know. So true. (laughs) 